Gather round, children, while I spin for you a yawn of heroes and villains. An epic tale of a movie studio falling ass backwards up the stairs into a mountainous pile of money. We open on a haggard-looking man, Gore, walking across a vast desert with his young daughter. She collapses in his arms from exhaustion, and we can see in his eyes how heartbroken he is. As he lays upon the stones marking her newly dug grave, he notices something in the distance, a small clump of trees. He makes his way there and discovers a beautiful oasis where a large and golden swathed man resides within. Gore reveals that this is no man, but a god. His god. And boy is this god an asshole. He rebuffs Gore and hurls insults pompously about him to some fairy folk. The god tells Gore that he just got done killing a god slayer and refers to a dead body on the ground. Lying next to it, the necro sword, a god slaying weapon. Fairly obvious, but minor continuity error here, the juice seeds on Gore's face keep shifting around from shot to shot. Gore renounces his belief in the god, and the god tries to kill him. The necro sword rises to meet Gore's hand, and he stabs it through the neck of the god, spilling gold everywhere and vowing that all gods must die. The movie is bookended by Korg telling the story of Thor Odinson to some kids around a campfire. I'm not sure whether that means the rest of the story is supposed to be Korg's version of the events that unfold, or not, since the film doesn't make that distinction. It would, however, give slight credence to the completely absurd and disjointed plot beats and incongruous characterizations. Otherwise, this thing is a mess. We're treated to a comedic recitation of a list of all the people close to Thor that have died. Hilarious. We're then told of his grand adventures with the Guardians of the Galaxy, a film that would undoubtedly have been better than this jumbled garbage cyclone which tries to recapture the successful recipe of Ragnarok, but instead comes off as a pale conceptual copycat. Every line of dialogue is a vain attempt at humor. Most of them fall flat and all celebrate the tonal equivalent of a drunken circus clown skateboarding naked through a funeral. Humorless and sad. Here we meet Jane Foster, who is in the hospital receiving chemo between Jane and What's-Her-Face is undermined by an endless string of jokes. And the jokes aren't funny. Treatment, and I'm not exactly sure what tone they're going for here, but the seriousness of the expository dumpster fire. Jane then instantly picks up a book about Norse mythology and miraculously opens it to a page describing the healing properties of Mjolnir, Thor's hammer. Too bad the hammer was shattered in Ragnarok. Good thing the pieces reside in a glass case of emotion somewhere in New England. We're then treated to another throwback in the form of a painfully unentertaining stage play starring Melissa McCarthy and Matt Damon, regaling the events of Ragnarok. Thor is then given three screaming goats that I will have to drink a half bottle of whiskey to erase from my brain. Like the goats... That's fantastic, because that gag is used several more times. More jokes ensue. We then see the only evidence in the film of Gore the God Butcher actually fulfilling his namesake as God Butcher, a four-second shot of a series of video screens showing the trail of his destruction. Then more jokes. Thor and Korg leave Earth to save Sif, one of the remaining Asgardians. On her deathbed, we get more jokes. She also exposits that Gore is heading to new Asgard next. How does she know this? Dunno. Thor and Korg head to new Asgard, and with the help of Valkyrie, wage war against Gore and a legion of demonic monstrosities. Suddenly Mjolnir flies across the battlefield, and the wielder is... Jane Foster, whom Thor doesn't immediately recognize because the hammer turned her hair blonde. Okay, sure, whatever. That's great that it can cure cancer and dye hair. What an amazing multi-tool. Korg then exposition vomits for us the story of Thor and Jane's love affair. I'd be curious to know how he had intimate details of their home life and how he knows that Thor whispered secretly one night in bed for Mjolnir to always protect Jane. Thor then tells the hammer that he loves it. Love that deep has a way of becoming magical. I don't think I've seen contrivance, convenience, and contradiction all in one shot before, but here we are. Korg continues to tell us of their breakup. 
They have a brief tete-a-tete, and Sheathor flies off, destroying several large monsters on the way. Where did she learn to fight? Couldn't tell you. Is the ability inherent to the hammer? Not sure. Moving on. Gore finally approaches the battle, and Thor cleaves his way towards the God Butcher. A couple of jokes here for flavor, I guess. I'm starting to really hate the taste of that. Gore escapes, but his horde of shadowy Cthulhu minions snatch all of Asgard's children from their beds and abduct them. We are then gifted some of the most awkwardly delivered, anti-quirky, and unfunny dialogue I've seen in a film in recent memory. The chemistry between Thor and Lady Thor is akin to the bond between blood and peanut butter. Some more jokes. Thor then tries to summon his ex-hammer to his hand, but the ex becomes jealous and intervenes. Right. So it summons lightning and gets jealous. I think Thor S. may have gotten the better end of the deal, weapons-wise. Thor makes an impassioned plea to the townsfolk, some exposition, jokes aplenty. The disembodied head of a young boy who happens to be Heimdall's son appears in the form of some god-awful CGI, makes an out-of-character Guns N' Roses reference, and tells our heroes where to go next, as all good plot devices do. Endless jokes. They then harness a Viking ship to the Screaming Goats, because that's what you do to get to the Shadow Realm to save the kids. And again, we're treated to a glimpse of the bizarre psychosexual relationship between Thor and his weaponry. More jokes, then cancer, then more jokes. They travel to the Golden Temple, the Las Vegas of the gods. More painfully unfunny jokes and impossibly awkward banter. Cut to the kids, trapped in a cage somewhere in the Shadow Realm in a scene so tonally inconsistent that it makes 2016's Ghostbusters seem like Shawshank Redemption, Christian Bale Heath Ledger's the ever-loving shit out of every syllable to an uncomfortable degree. A joke or two. We're then introduced to Zeus, as portrayed in unbelievably embarrassing fashion by the very talented Russell Crowe. I imagine the pitch meeting with his agent went something like this. They want you to play Zeus in the new Thor movie, Russell. Zeus, eh? Sounds badass. I'm in. I'm not sure what the polar opposite of badass is, but that's what we've got here. A foppish, overtly pompous, hyper-perverted, confoundingly insipid, skirt-clad shopping mall Santa brandishing a Greek accent so thick that I'd be willing to bet that his dick ejaculated mint jelly, and without an ounce of self-awareness. Thank Christ they kill him quickly. Mm, sort of. But not before we are expositionally enlightened about the prospect that Gore is trying to reach eternity, a being at the center of the universe that grants one wish to the first person to reach it. Telling my earlier comment about contrivance, convenience, and contradiction to hold my beer. Naked Thor and jokes ensue. They steal his magic styrofoam thunderbolt and Korg is killed. Sort of. Screaming goats, some GNR, and we're off to the Shadow Realm. Thor magic eye talks to the kids. A barrage of jokes and Thor's love triangle with his axe approaches second base. More stunningly uncomfortable conversation between Thor and foe Thor. Holy mother of jumping Jesus on a pogo stick. There are still 50 fucking minutes left of this catastrophically insufferable butt clench. I need another drink. We arrive on Shadow Planet, and this sequence is actually visually very impressive. All color is removed as this place exists in a palette of only light and dark. More screaming fucking goats. Our cadre of Thors and Valkyrie approach Gore's lair. Fem Thor realizes that the key to Gore accessing eternity is real Thor's axe, Stormbreaker, so of course she hurls it into space. Gore appears, jokes ensue, and Christian Bale chews up the scenery like a rabid beaver in a bookstore. Thor summons the axe and goes toe-to-toe with Gore. Gotta say, this fight is pretty sweet. A wounded Gore then tricks Thor into relinquishing the axe as our heroes are teleported to Earth. More cancer, more jokes, and some delicious exposition. Gore approaches the gates of eternity, axe in hand. Thor arrives as the gate begins to open. Gore unleashes a horde of monsters as Thor imbues the kids with the power of the Thor. This looks great, but it raises a bevy of questions. Why hasn't he done this before? Does it sap his own power? If that's the case and he needs his full power to defeat Gore, what the silly fuck is going on here? Cue November Rain, and okay, you got me, movie. Nice one. Thor gets his ass handed to him by Gore, and just as he's about to be skewered, Thorita shows up and trounces the Shadow Puppet Master. She summons the power of Thor and destroys both Mjolnir and the Necrosword, 
but not before Gore is able to reach the gate and approach eternity. As Gore is about to achieve his goal and get his wish of killing all gods, Jane collapses, and Thor persuades Gore to use his wish to bring his daughter back, saying that she will be cared for. It's a touching moment, but it doesn't feel particularly earned. If Gore can be so easily maneuvered with but a single sentence, why did the entire rest of the movie need to happen? I'm still not clear as to why Gore has to die, forcing Thor to raise his daughter. Anywho, Jane dies from the cancer, being sucked dry by Mjolnir, and despite us being told that only warriors who die in battle can be welcomed into Valhalla, is shown being accepted by Heimdall into the gates of Valhalla. Thor raises Gore's daughter as his own, Kork gets his body back and a husband to boot, and all is right with the world again. Odin be praised. What a fucking slog. There are several great themes here. Love conquers all. Family is more important than revenge. Unfortunately, the execution has all of the merits of a class nerd showing up at the end of the school year party, getting shit-faced drunk and trying desperately to fit in by dropping terrible puns every ten seconds. I sympathize. It reuses jokes that were only marginally funny the first time around and long outstay their welcome. In the end, Thor, Fluff and Blunder feels like a movie that was written as a series of gags that had a plot loosely crafted around them.